And we've just pushed this out. Let's see where we are. Um, I'm Emil Guillermo. If you're if you're watching us, you're catching the behind the scenes setup of our Fonz virtual Fonz museum uh, setup. Um, I uh, it's a special show today, and technically speaking, we have about I say I say the show starts at twelve, but it really technically starts at eleven forty five when we set up. So. That's what we're doing here. And I see we have our on our Facebook page, we have uh, you see our guest, you see our guest on our Facebook page, and you see me uh, figuring out what the heck I'm doing here. Oh, I know <laughs> what the heck I'm doing. I know what the heck I'm doing. Anyway, uh, welcome to the virtual Fonz Museum pop up. It's another one. We've been doing this thing now for the last couple of weeks because we've decided how cool it is to go live on Facebook. Who would have thought that uh, it would be this cool to go live on Facebook? You see my guests there and look, I'm learning little tricks like uh, learning how to pin my video so you don't see him. I, I don't think you shouldn't see him yet. I, I'm, gotcha. going to I'm going to reveal, you heard him there. I'm going to reveal him in a second. <laughs> but uh, you know, if you're here, thank you very much for being here early. Um, this thing starts at 12, but uh, the early birds get a little something special. And that little something special, you know, in uh, New Orleans, they'd say, a la nyap, right? The, the little something extra is our, uh, our setup. You know, this is the behind the scenes look. We are at the museum. We are closed again this week because of COVID. We've been closed since March and we miss you. We miss you guys coming in and gals coming into the museum on Weber Avenue in Stockton to see exactly what we had, to see our wares, to, to go in our little bookshop and see all the things that we have for you to buy and for you to say, oh, I think I'm going to donate to these people here at the Fonz Museum, the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum, because the, what they do here is really a mission. They're on a mission to tell the Filipino American story. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we do. We're on, we're on a, we're on a, a mission to tell the Filipino American story. And if you want to help us um, go on our page and look in ways that you can donate and make a contribution, we're a 501 C three. We're closed because of COVID, but you know, it's funny that the landlord doesn't close down. The landlord still has, you know, they have their business and we still pay our rent and we don't have people coming into the bookstore. We don't have people coming in making donations. We don't have people coming in. And this is the best we can do to be virtual on Saturday and Sunday and say, hey, hi, salamat, mabuhay. You know, we, we can do all that. You won't find us doing the tinnacling though. We, we will not, we draw the line. We do not do the tinnacling. Not at the font. Maybe somewhere else you can do find the tinnacling, but I will not do the. Maybe the candle dance. I don't know. I mean, if if convinced that, that it would be a good thing, maybe. But look, we talk about real Filipino American history at the museum, and we use this space here, this this Zoom space to to take up for when we used to have our programs at the Fonz Museum, and we'd bring in people to make presentations to talk about things like. We have a great little exhibit now on cockfighting, which is really kind of cool because it is a Filipino American thing. And I, I, our guests who I have waiting in the wings will, will uh, come on and talk about, well, can talk about that, but we're going to talk about <laughs> Elena and the grave strike and all that. But this is our public square. This is, we talk about Filipino American history and we invite you to make a donation. Remember, we're a 501c3, a totally legit 501c3, and all your donations are tax deductible. So whatever you can afford, whatever you want to give, maybe you just want to tell people, if you just don't give money, just tell your people in your network that we're doing this. And these videos that we do are, are live on our Fonz Museum page. But it would also be nice to throw in a few bucks and say, hey, look, help these guys because they are the virtual museum they are telling the Filipino American story. And what I like to say is I like to say that the Fonz Museum 
is where you are. Where you are, that's where the museum is. Essentially, I'm saying you are the museum because you are the guts, you are the you are the story. You're the Filipino American story. And I think you'll see in what we do today, we're gonna to be talking about the Filipino American story. Uh, one of the things that we've done in the past, we'd like to talk about what I call TWIFA. This week in American, or this week in Filipino American history. That's TWIFA, T-W-I-F-A, TWIFA. So TWIFA, this week in Filipino American history. Today is the fifth, and if you have a Filipino American history National Historical Society Museum calendar, you know that on the fifth, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee met at their headquarters in Stockton and decided to have a strike on the fifth. They decided to have a strike. And they decided they were going to strike 33 growers in Delano, California, which if you look at the map of the great Central Valley, you look at the map of California, look at the parts that people usually ignore, the Central Valley. They usually go coast to coast, which in California terms is like San Francisco or Los Angeles to Lake Tahoe, coast to coast, California wise. And the parts in the middle, they ignore. Flyover, flyover parts of the, of the state. Shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a flyover part of the state because this is the breadbasket. This is where the, the real industry of California took place, the growing of food to feed the nation and the world, right? But this is where the Filipinos were too. They were in the Central Valley. So these stories here, are the this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about what happened uh, today, this week in Filipino American history, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, AFL-CIO, said we're gonna strike, we're gonna to go to the, the growers in Delano, we're gonna demand higher pay, we want $1.40 an hour, imagine that, $1.40 an hour. $1.40 an hour, man. It wasn't too long ago when, oh God, I got a raise to a buck 65. I remember those days, my first days in radio, my first days in television. Emil, we like you so much, we're gonna give you $3 an hour. You're a star, that's what they say. Or my first job in radio, hey, welcome to big time in radio, Houston, Texas. You get $1.65. Wow, God, that's a little more than Larry got in 1965. So that's what, that's what the grape, the, what AWOC, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, were, they were fighting for, $1.40. They went down to Delano, which is about two and a half hours from, from Stockton. And they took a vote. And that's when the history began. But it began September 5th. The vote happened September 7th. And then the thing actually began on the 8th, we'll get into that today, just sort of painting the groundwork for what we're gonna talk about today on our virtual museum pop-up. But this is it, this is the virtual museum pop-up. And if you're here, really, I'm, I'm super glad that you're here uh, because I do it live because for some reason, when you do it live, people get all, like, they get crazy. They think, oh, why, it's live, I, this, this must be something 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 special well it is it's live but you can catch us also uh when when we're not live hmm what's the opposite of not live that's not good <laughs> no not live just means we're recorded uh, you can catch us when we're recorded later but it's better to catch us live here at 12 noon but now for those of you who uh came in extra Thank you very much for joining us uh, as an early bird because you know how special this is and you know why we do this and why I do this in, oh my God, I've been doing this in my closet. And you can see that in fact, it is my closet when in fact, I should be putting up our, uh, our virtual background. And, and now you know, oh, it's not Emil's closet, it's, 
the Virtual Fonds Museum, the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum. Okay, good. Okay, now I'm not a closeted Filipino. I'm just a, a Fonds Museum Filipino. And so if you're joining us, thank you again. It's 12 noon Pacific, three o'clock on the East. Uh, we do these virtual museum pop-ups because we miss you. We're closed at the museum and this is our way of reaching out and talking about the very thing that makes the museum the museum, which is the storyteller of Filipino American history. So this week I talked to you, told, told you about this week in Filipino American history, the day February, uh, uh, September 5th, the day ag the agricultural workers organizing committee took, um, decided they would take the vote. It was on the 5th. They went down on the 7th to Delano because that's where the workers and the growers were. They took the vote. And joining me now uh, to uh, share uh, this story and to tell this story is Alex uh, Idelor of uh, Delano. Hi, Alex. Hey, how are you, Emil? I'm fine, thank you. Really, I appreciate you coming on to talk to us about about this. Alex is also the president of the Delano Filipino American National Historical Society uh, chapter. And, uh, and you have a unique perspective because not only are you a Filipino American from Delano, you lived through the strike. Yes, sir. I was 10 years old uh, coming home from school on the first or second day of the, I think my sixth grade. And I was going looking forward to uh, uh, an afternoon of TV and and, and munchies, and yeah. lo and behold, mom and dad are home. Uh, my, my initial reaction was, "Darn it, I can't have my <laughs> snacks and watch cartoons." But then it dawned on me because their their visage was very serious, and they yeah. said, "Hey, we're on strike," and boom, uh, I was I was a pretty woke child. I was pretty uh, aware. My dad would watch the nightly news every night. And so I would watch the news with him. And I knew that a strike of this magnitude was big. Yeah. So I knew something was up, even right, at 10 years old. Are right, you're 10 years old. You're going to watch, what kind of cartoons were you going to watch? We want to get into the detail. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, man, I can't remember. I'm a, I'm a big Rock and Bullwinkle fan. Oh, all right. And so, so Bullwinkle <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Moose and Squirrel. Yeah. Yes, yes I get it. Moose and Squirrel, and then, um, Mr. Pe Mr. Peabody was my a role model, uh, yeah. kind of an egghead guy who knew everything, and I, I try to emulate that guy. So, <laughs> you, so you're at home, you're kind of a latchkey kid, you came home, yep. and you're going to like sit down, get your snacks after school, and your parents come in. Now, tell me about your parents. They were, okay. they were workers. They worked in the fields, huh? Yeah, you know what? They... Um, uh, obviously, I'm very proud of my parents. My mom was a school teacher back in the Philippines. She was a first year, first grade teacher. Uh, she taught for 13 years before uh, she decided to uproot her career and her livelihood in her, in her home, basically, to come for us. And then my dad uh, fought in World War II as a Philippine scout. Uh, that above me, if you can see, is the, is the US flag that was given to me at his funeral. Yeah, um, he is a congressional uh, gold medal winner, so I'm wow. especially proud of that. But he took advantage of uh, his U.S. citizenship to come over to to the United States in 1952, mm -hmm. and he was uh, he joined the Manos, uh, the, the rank of of the single uh, male uh, Filipino workers who he did the circuit, you know, Alaska in the, in the spring, uh, Stockton in the in the later spring. Uh, Coachella Valley in the early summer, and then Delano through much of the fall. Um, well, well, wait a minute. Now. And he he was in in fifty two. He came, and this is important because he fought as a scout. Those were the original. Those are the guys who were most of the Filipinos were in the Bataan Death March were scouts, uh, and the the Filipino was there. who answered the call of of uh, Roosevelt to say fight side by side and you can gain citizenship. So he got citizenship 
but he was also kind of wasn't it rescinded or did at that point did he come as a he was able to come as a national what was his status after the war because we know about the rescission act which took away the citizenship of of the fighters for what i understand there there were two promises made to the filipinos to join the armed forces uh, citizenship and commensurate pay in other words they promised they would pay the Filipinos the same rate as the American soldiers. Right. Okay, with the Rescission Act, uh, uh, they couldn't res rescind the uh, citizenship, but they did rescind the pay. I see. So, but he he had, he came over, he had this status as a citizen, could come over to America, mm -hmm. waited till 52, and now he was one of the, he was, uh, I guess because he fought in the war, I mean, my father came in the 20s, so and and did not fight in the war. He was a little older, but your father coming in, in the 50s, he was like a new generation of American Filipino coming into. Uh, the, did he come into the valley first, San Francisco, L.A.? Where? How did he enter? Yep, yep. We uh, we uh, traveled by ship, uh, the USS President Wilson, for 21 days. We were we crossed the Pacific. We uh, we sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge and. Uh, Five-year-old kid like, like me uh, tried to throw throw a coin onto the Golden Gate because okay. uh, I don't know if you know that that was a tradition that if you could you could land a coin from the ship to the bridge you will have good luck. Wow! And not only that, you probably be signed by the uh, New York <laughs> Giants to play baseball. <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute now. This is a new twist. I didn't know this. You yeah. were born in the Philippines. I was born. In the Philippines, I came here when I was five years old. So, um, what it is, my dad, my dad came over in '52, but he came alone. Mm, I he see. came alone while the rest of us uh, came home. Well, um, he came for a vacation in '54, <laughs> and yeah. lo and behold, I was conceived in October. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Um, so I was born without a dad. He he went back to the United States before I was born. So I never really met my dad until we landed on the San Francisco docks. And uh, it was a, it was kind of humorous, funny story. My mom had to correct me because I would call my dad by his first name. Yeah. Because I would hear my mom call him, hey, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. You know, so I said, hey, Eddie, wh uh, where are we going next? And then my mom said, no, that, that's your father. <laughs> and I go, really? See okay. <laughs> a lot of people don't know this, but this is what happens to Filipino families. And we get we get a little confused. You can't you can't you got to understand that this this happens. But all right, you're a five year old kid. What 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 place in the Philippines? What province? I was I was born in Muntinlupa, Rizal, uh -huh. uh, Rizal province. We're, uh, we're uh, two blocks away from Laguna de Bay. And about uh, uh, back in the day, it was maybe uh, an hour's bus ride to Manila. Now it's like 20 minutes. Right. Uh, so, yeah. And so, um, so you're I, under I got to be, I got to be a little Filipino kid. You know, we, we would pump water from the puso, you know, and then yeah. uh, my grandmother would, would, would beat us on the, on the, on the legs with a stick. If we did do as we were told, uh, I remember a story of, a, uh, I remember witnessing a, a snake coming out of the bottom of our sink. Yeah. And, uh, and my mom call, calling uh, uh, her neighbors, the, the men came over, scissored the snake out of the thing and beat the crap out of it. <laughs> and so I got to experience both worlds. I got to experience uh, living life as a kid in the Philippines and also living life as a Filipino kid in the United States. So yeah, I have both feet in uh, a foot apiece uh, uh, in the United States and the Philippines. Yeah, so, so you were five years old you threw mm -hmm. the coin from the Wilson. Like my father yep. was on the uh, Franklin Pierce. He was okay. on the USS Franklin Pierce. I don't think he knew about the uh, throwing <laughs> a coin under the bridge or to the bridge. Uh -huh. Otherwise, like I said, he would have been signed by the Yankees or something. <laughs> but, but you uh, were on that boat. You get to San Francisco, and then they, they come, go immediately to Stockton. What happened? Wow, it was uh, it was a blur. And I remember I was disappointed because I was I was a little kid. I, I'd seen Manila as a kid, but but San Francisco was was totally lit up. I think we arrived at night, and yeah. it was totally lit up. And of course, five year old kid, 
I was entranced. I was like, oh, wow. So this is the United States. And let me tell you a little story about me. Whenever, as a little boy in the Philippines, when we found out that we were going to immigrate to the, to the United States, my little five-year-old mind uh, imagined this dark sky with really bright stars. That was my impression of the United States. And here, landing in San Francisco at night, seeing the lights of San Francisco, I thought this was it, because they looked like stars, all the little lights of the city. And um, all of a sudden, I get thrown into the back seat of a 57 Plymouth, and we drove for, for it seemed like days, but it was actually several hours to Delano. We actually, uh, my dad had established uh, uh, that he was going to set up shop in Delano. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember as a, as a teenager, I looked at my dad and says, you gave up San Francisco, the, <laughs> the city, for Delano? Even then, so, you were kind of like a snob, Alex. <laughs> I was kind of a snob. <laughs> and, so, and so, but you know what? You know, he made the right decision because growing up in Delano, to me, it was the richest experience. A little kid could have. Tell me, I see you get a little emotional there. Uh, I cried to sad movies. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was there in Delano. What what did he set up? He was going to set up life. How did it work out so that both your mom and your dad were working on the farms right. the week they decided to call for a strike? Well, we were, uh, you got to remember the, the, the composition of Delano. Uh, we were we were kind of like townies. Uh, we lived in the, in the town of Delano. Uh, we lived in a single family, you know, nuclear family. And then there was, there, there was a segment of the Filipino community that were the Manos. They were the bachelor men who lived uh, outlying in, uh, uh, in the camps, the labor camps. And, and then there was a third one of uh, the Mestizos. The, the Filipinos, uh, Mexican, the Filipino Native American, Filipino African American households that were uh, kind of mixed uh, heritage. And so um, to me, that was the, that was the, 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 the magic of Larry Itliong. I know that there were, uh, it was said that Larry's gift was communication. He was able to talk to the mestizos, he was able to talk to the the, the nuclear families like us, uh, born and raised in the Philippines, uh, but living in the United States, and then the and then the uh, the the mano, he was able to talk to them and convince them of this thing. He convinced my dad and my mom, and they were totally against it. They were they were frightened to death because they were against, they were they were against the strike. They didn't want they, to strike. Well, no, what. what they, they wanted the pay and they wanted the safe working conditions. Don't get me wrong. They knew the purpose of it, but the mechanics of it, of being out without a paycheck. And right, right, right at the beginning of the school year, uh, you know, my, my sister was, was, uh, uh, had turned 17. Uh, she's, her birthday's tomorrow, by the way. Happy birthday, Philomena. <laughs> and, Happy birthday, uh, Philomena. <laughs> she, she turned 17, and then two days later, they walk out of their of their of, of uh, earning them earning their livelihood yeah. they were scared yeah. but they walked out because they knew that we got to go you know it's it's uh larry larry was convincing enough to them and uh to, to that i'm very proud of my mom and dad i know that uh, the dinner table conversations leading up to the great strike were very tense there was a lot of uh concern yeah. um it could be said that the man was more willing to go because the Manongs were aging, they were getting older, and they they were wanting uh, uh, to get their, to get theirs now, not later. Uh, my mom and dad were probably thinking, well, maybe later when the kids are grown up, you know. But that was that wasn't the case. Sometimes history is thrust upon them, and you got to go. What did they do uh, as farm laborers? What what was their concern? And describe the conditions they had to live under that yeah. would force a strike? I, I think we, we were more, uh, we were more middle class than, than, than others because uh, both parents were working. Um, there were only two of us and you know, Filipino families, I, I knew neighbors that had six or eight kids. And you know, to them, uh, walking out on their livelihood was, was more impactful than ours. We had a, we lived in a rental uh, two bedroom house 
um, no garage, little carport. Uh, we had a 58 Chevy was our car, uh, which was about seven years old um, at the time. So uh, I had shoes, I had clothes. Uh, my mom uh, uh, darned our darned my my pants. Uh, we were very meager, but you know, my mom and dad were that were that members of that greatest generation. They knew how to scrimp and save, right? Right. <laughs> I know. My mom, my mom would save bags, right, for you uh, for for use later. She never would waste anything. Um, in fact, uh, we arrived in 1959, six one year after the grape strike. And seven years after we immigrated here, my mom and dad had saved enough money to to have built uh, uh, and constructed uh, their their own three bedroom, two car garage home in Delano. In Delano. In Delano. Wow. And so and, and that was a. I mean, look. If I was an anti strike guy, if mm -hmm. I was a pro pro grower, I'd say, oh, look, we if you do it right. You can mm -hmm. be a grower and you can make enough money mm -hmm. to have your suburban life here in Delano, right? Right. And it, it was that. It was, uh, I remember watching Leave it to Beaver and thinking, that's us. Because yeah. I got a mom and dad. I said, I said, mom works. And my mom was amazing. I mean, she would, she would, uh, she would make us breakfast. She would, she would, uh, um, during school day, she would make us breakfast and leave it for us because they have to leave at like six o'clock uh, yeah. to, to get to work. And then, um, and then when she gets home, and then she would maybe prep uh, for dinner, and then she'd come home about three thirty or four, make dinner and stuff, and get ready for the next day. She was she was just uh, a beast about that. My dad took care of the yard, took care of everything else around the house, and so um, very 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 thankful and grateful for my for my upbringing. But you know what? Uh, other people will look at my life and say, "God, you guys were poor." You know what? We didn't know any different. Yeah. We didn't, and I got I got my Rocky and Bullwinkle. I got my my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I got my uh, my peanut bet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, you had, no. Hey, look. You know, it's funny, Alex. We're not too far apart age wise. And my father was came in nineteen twenty eight, a year before Larry Itleon, yeah. and but he was a unionist, wanted to stay in San Francisco. He worked as a cook. And I remember I had the same kind of upbringing. I had my, you know, cre creature features or whatever they call it, the <laughs> afternoon show after school. I had my, my mom made me my little, uh, you know, before I was vegan, my mom would make me tapa, you know, with rice and, and uh, you know, and we didn't know any different either, right? We were in the city. So we, we were sort of like, have these mirror kind of things, except in 65, you know, I'm thinking about how I'm going to play baseball, and but you are are on your couch, and you see your parents saying we're on strike, and you said even up into the up until the strike vote, it was pretty tense in your household, huh? Yeah, what, what, it was. What was the discussion? Well, the, the, well, the, well, the discussion was how we're going to keep our our kids fed because you know we had lunch tickets, you know, we'd buy lunch tickets for school. Um, uh, we already had our clothes, so we were set there. But then, you know. There were the utilities, the uh, the rental, uh, the car payment. Uh, so uh, I don't know how they did it, but I knew it was very tense. And I knew, um, but you know what? My mom grew up in the Philippines. She was a, in her late teens, and she was forced to work out in the in the, in the rice paddies by the Japanese soldiers. So she knew what, what living under the occupation. She called it occupation when the Japanese were in charge. She knew what, uh, uh, how to scrimp and save, how to how to make a meal out of nothing like old rice and whatever was in the cupboard, you know, dried dried fish. She knew how to make uh, things stretch out, uh, and so uh, she was doing that. And she that was already in her wheelhouse. We were eating. Uh, to me, I thought we were eating uh, like kings, but probably she was probably finding some leftover meats and making making uh, gold out of them. And so uh, that's that's the way she was, and that's the way we were. Um, my mom wouldn't let a piece of clothing go without being uh, sewn up several times and lasting another several months. I would go through shoes every several months because I was growing so fast. Uh, so, 
but my mom just, you know, my mom and dad just, just kept us fed and kept us clothed. And that was a miracle that during the strike, that was very tense. And my dad would go off to go pick it, you know, and then uh, he would have, uh, he would have his breakfast at the, at the Filipino community hall before he, he went to the pickets. And so that was, that was a kind of a saving grace for us until, well, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, oh, until, well, several, yeah. until several months later, several yeah. weeks later, my dad comes home and finds out that the, the stipend for picketing was only five dollars a week. Right. So yeah. that that you know that that was the, uh, they were between a rock and a hard place. They had to make they had to make sense of it while they respected the the movement. Everybody was on strike, but then uh, uh, little by little, the families were the first ones to cave in and go back to work. So they did. Uh, Some people did go back to work. I mean, the strike lasted went back five to years work. from 65 yeah. to 70, but some people went back to work. Yeah, and it was it was rough for them. And let me tell you, uh, the little pristine uh, living to beaver life uh, of Delano, because we were a large Filipino uh, community. I mean, uh, our cat, we had a Catholic church. We had a Filipino community hall. We had our, our ladies who, who managed all the social events, you know, it was life was great. When the strike happened, then you had the, the, the schism between are you with us on the strike or are you against us? And so um, blood against blood. My, my, my god brother, Johnny Armington, his dad was a huge uh, uh, force in the, in, the, in the strike movement. We had to walk away a little bit. You know, we, we never forgot each other, though. We knew that we were, we were uh, this linked together. Uh, because he, my mom and dad his, were his, grand, his godparents, but, you know, we, we walked away when, when the conversation came to the strike. Well, well, tell me about that blood versus blood thing. When your parents went back to work and some people stayed on strike, the tension yeah. what was real. Was it, was it ever violent or was it ever, did it really get nasty or were people just under understanding that you did what you had to do. You know what, um, let me start out with, with, with my experience first. Um, we were, I, I was kind of insulated to, to any kind of violence. If there was any talk about, about threats or anything like that, I was, I, was, uh, I was not aware of it. Although I could sense the tension. I could sense the tension that my dad had to work a little, had, had to get up a little bit earlier to go to work to avoid the pickets because I guess they were they were throwing rocks. I, uh, later in 1973, I, I experienced that firsthand when the Teamsters came in, but that's a different story. Yeah. That was that was a total total mess. Totally but different. during the time, my dad had to wake up earlier. He had to avoid uh, you know certain certain we had to avoid certain families because you know uh, we didn't want to have to uh, confront each other about the strike. They were they were very I, I had. I had a, where, where my dad worked, uh, the camp, all those models were my uncles. Mm -hmm. You know, on Sundays, my dad would take me with him so he could play cards in the rec room at the, at the camp. Well, those old models treated me like their, like their son. I mean, they, they would buy me sodas and drinks and stuff and keep me entertained. Um, and then the sad, the sad part of about this, I, I share my, this story to, to some people was that the Manongs in, in camp were so, so pleased to see a, a young Filipino boy actually speak Tagalog. Mm. You know, they would pay me to say something in Tagalog. Like, what would they pay you? I mean, what, what would they pay you? What would they, you say? They, they buy me a soda, hoy, uh, uh, say something in Tagalog. And I would rattle off in Tagalog. And they just laugh and they'd hug me. And, you, and uh, as an adult, I realized that they had been uh, they've been kept away from that, that kind of family uh, environment. And it's, it, it's, it's just truly the, the sadness uh, of that. And those guys were like my uncles. I mean, they would buy me clothes for school. Uh, man, uh, I was, uh, I love them to death. Yeah. You know, I, I know what you mean. I mean, my father would have been their age, right? My, my father came in the 20s. Yeah. Uh, he didn't want to go to the fields because he, not that he was lazy, but he wanted to cook the vegetables, not pick them. And, uh, <laughs> but my uncles 
his fellow Filipinos who also went to the restaurants with him to the kitchens, they were like that. And they would say, oh, you eat, you eat this, you eat, you know, they would invite <laughs> me to the kitchens and they would give me French fries and we'd eat, oh, French okay. fries, you know, I mean, I'm in the kitchen with the cooks and they're giving me all the extra French fries. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but they were lucky because they didn't have the Delano experience like you did. I mean, their, their experience was tough too. The cooks mm -hmm. union local too had their issues, but you're there in Delano where it was, this was the fight. This was where civil rights and labor rights met social justice met. How, you know, that had to, what was your, your understanding of that? You knew that they were fighting for conditions, better conditions, and for for pay, did did Larry ever come to your family, to to your mom and dad, and and tell them this is why we're on strike? No, uh, not not physically, but my dad had encountered him several times. Uh, our family knew his family, um, uh, but I, I, when you were talking, I was thinking this. I, I had an early experience uh, with uh, social justice and and labor. Okay. 1962, I think, or 61, it, it escapes me, but my mom was a school teacher in the Philippines, college educated. Um, she wrote a letter to her boss, her, the farmer, the, uh, the farmer, the, he, uh, Zaninovich was, was his name, and uh, asking for equal pay between men and women. I'm talking about 1961-62. Um, here we were in a work crew of men and women, right? For some reason, men were paid, uh, what was it, a dollar uh, uh, ten an hour, I think, and women were paid 95 cents. Shock, right? Yeah. Even the, and then in her letter, it was very polite. She's very polite. Uh, uh, she said, outside of girdling, which was a very physical task, uh, in the fields where you have to take a knife and you cut rings around the, uh, the, uh, the vine to, to promote sugar coming up into, the, into the, uh, the berries. Other than that, other than pruning in the wintertime, which was, uh, if you know, it's uh, upper body strength. You have to cut, cut off the, lop off the, the branch so that new growth will come in the spring. Well, other than those two jobs, the men and the women, the husbands and the wives, work side by side. She wrote this letter to the grower. And um, I remember uh, I was out in the fields because I was uh, I was a little kid and and, uh, and my mom had to bring me with her. And so I would hang out and, uh, uh, while they worked in the fields. And so the, uh, the, her co-workers were angry at her. They said, oh, Nati, you're gonna get us in trouble. You're gonna get us all fired. You know, uh, you know, you know I, I, I try to be as polite as possible. So. One day, uh, the, the big boss comes, the, the grower. Uh, there's uh, in the pickup truck and this ball of dust and everybody got all nervous. He walks out with a piece of paper in his hand. And he tells the crew, he says, which one of you, got, uh, which one of you ladies wrote this letter? And I remember right away, the, 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 the other women started pointing to my mom. <laughs> it's her, it's her. It's her, it's her. It wasn't me, it was her. And you know what? The grower came up to my mom and said, I showed this letter to my wife, the grower's wife. And uh, his wife told him, can you answer the question? Why are they paid uh, 15 cents less than men? And he, he said, I didn't have an answer. So he said, starting next pay period, we're gonna make the pay equal. And uh, my mom went from from the vilified person to this this hero. She had uh, she had gained uh, equal pay for women in 1961 or 62. Yeah, wow. That's and she did it on her own. She did it on her own. There was no labor movement. There was no. <laughs> she just well, did it on her own. Well, that's a great story. That shows your mom had the the soul of social yep. activism, yep. and she knew what to do. Uh, I mean, we all have different paths. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry had a path. 
Larry Itliong and but but uh, that's a very that's a great story about your mom. Uh, if you're oh, just man. yeah, if you're just joining us, uh, I'm talking with Alex Idelor. Alex is the president of the Filipino American National Historical Society um, in Delano, the chapter there. And we're talking really about Filipinos, the sort of the undercurrent story. This is September. Well, we're doing this on September 5th, the day mm -hmm. the AWOC decided to go on strike. They had to take the vote later, two days later, September 7th in Delano. But we're talking about how that happened in Filipino American history, the impact on Filipino families, on Filipino families like Alex's, who, who they lived through the, the grave strike. And we're, we're gonna talk about that vote. If you have questions about, about Larry Itliong and the grave strike, put it in the chat box on Facebook Live and we'll, we'll answer them. Sometimes it uh, takes a while for us, there's a little lag to get to your questions, but put them in the chat and I, we will answer them. But Alex, tell me once again, to go back to the main story about Larry going down to Delano, mm -hmm. the night of the vote. The decision to strike was on the 5th. They go down to Delano on the 7th. They take the vote. Your parents were there in the hall. No? Yeah. I imagine. My, so my dad was. My dad was. My, my mom stayed on. So you're, they're in the hall. And we had Bob Armington, who had her recollection about what happened in the hall. And it was really a simple vote. It's like Larry Itliong says, who's with me, right? And it was right. unanimous. And it was it it was unanimous. Did what did your father say anything about the vote to you? You know, I only uh, learned it was unanimous, uh, you know, later on, but uh, I, di I didn't know. But I remember, um, you know, I don't remember uh, my dad coming home from that. Maybe I was already asleep. But uh, I remember at an earlier meeting, uh, my dad came home and kind of shared at the dinner table what, what was going on to say that, yeah, they want us to, go, to walk out and stuff. So I knew it was kind of brewing, but I don't know any, any of the specifics of that vote. Um, I know my dad was, a, he was kind of a, a, a quiet guy. He, he wasn't going to raise any, 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 any stink about anything. And I think he just went along because he just, he just thought that that was the right thing to do. And, and uh, all his compadres were, were voting for it. So, so he went with it and stuff, but I knew that he wasn't, uh, he, he was very concerned about it. Um, the, uh, uh, the thing about Larry is that you can say what you will about Larry, but Larry has got a strong presence. Larry's very convincing. He's, uh, if you walk into room, you knew Larry was there. <laughs> uh, maybe from the cackle in his voice, in, in his laughter, or, or from his, or from his conversation, but his personality kind of exuded. And I got to know Larry, uh, uh, in the, in the seventies, uh, uh, after his, uh, sit with the UFW, uh, I would come, come to his house. Uh, he would invite us, my, my buddy Roger and me, we were both uh, two young uh, Filipino guys who just uh, wanted to party. <laughs> and uh, we would bring a six pack of beer uh, and sit down with Larry and just, uh, just chat about, he would love to tell stories to us. We were, we were like his, uh, his audience. Yeah. He wanted to tell stories. And you know, Emil, the one regret I have is if I had known any better, because yeah, I didn't know, I knew Larry started a strike. I knew Larry was this and that, but to come down and realize that that this was a historical figure, uh, I would have taken notes because he was telling me everything about what, what happened in, in Seattle, what happened in Alaska, what happened here. Oh my God, Don Mobalon's spirit was probably rolling in the grave because uh, she, if, if I recorded that conversation, those conversations, it would have been her, uh, her, her, the basis for her, uh, uh, it would have made her research a lot easier. Well, well, tell uh, me, did he mention the grave strike? I mean, he must have known that your father and your and your yeah. mother were, were workers. And he say, yeah. did he did he say anything about it? And or did he look at you and say, well, we didn't get hurt by the grave strike if we get two young boys giving me beer. <laughs> no, you know what? He was not. He was not. He was never resentful. You know, uh, he knew that my mom and dad went back to work, uh, but. Um, I, I got to tell you a story of a, of a colleague, of a friend of mine in Delano. Uh, they lived uh, behind, across one fence 
from Larry Itlion, and in the height of the grape strike, you know, uh, my, 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 my friend's dad tells Larry, Larry, I know what you're doing is right, but I can't go with you. I can't, I can't walk out with you because he's got businesses, uh, other businesses and stuff. And Larry, uh, instead of attacking him, he said, I understand, Father. I understand. So he was, while he was an activist and he was such a, such a uh, raw and fierceful fighter for, for the right and what was good, he recognized the small stories of individual families and their struggles, and he knew. And that's why, that's why he was such a, so he had such a passion for building Ugg Beyond the Village. It wasn't just about the, the, the wages, the, the security. He was, there, he was there for us, for the, for the Filipinos, for the, uh, for the, for the underrepresented. Yeah. Did you care if you're Filipino or not? No, yeah. he married Mexicans. And, uh, he spoke about six languages. Yeah. And so it wasn't about uh, wages. To him, it was about dignity. Dignity. You yeah. know, it, it always comes down with when you when you get to some of these other stories about it, Leong, and uh, we'll talk more about Larry, say, when his birthday comes up in October and during the <laughs> history month. But he has some great stories that some people have captured where he mm -hmm. shows his loyalty uh, to the Filipino and how he wouldn't sell out the Filipino, how mm -hmm. he would stand up for them, you know, against uh he would sacrifice, you know, people yeah. would offer him money and he would say, no, I don't want your money. He'd stand mm -hmm. up, stand up for the Filipino. So, yeah. you know, so this thing about Larry, um, Larry Itliong, you were saying that he, he brought everyone together, the mestizos, the nuclear family, the Philippines, uh, from the Philippines, the, the workers, uh, he brought together those who uh, intermarried with Philippine, uh, with blacks and Mexicans, and they were all part of the, of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the of the migrant class or the uh, the ag mm -hmm. work class, but how about the middle class Filipino? Because there was still a number of those. Was he just alienated from them, or did he say how did he view them? Because there was a certain class, even in Delano to this day, sure, that isn't quite with Larry at Leong, even looking back in the past. Yeah, you know uh, the, the the story that the Filipinos were 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 is one political body is is incorrect. You know there uh, there there were there was a, a group of uh, professionals. I would say uh, the teachers, the the nurses, the community. They didn't have a a, a horse in this race. You know uh, they they saw the strike as uh, they're more conservative. They saw the strike as as, as chaotic, it, it, it actually did turn their lives upside down. Oh, glue, uh, glue. They, them, you know, you know, don't, don't rock the boat, right? Yeah, that yeah. was the, that, that was the phrase uh, that was uh, uh, taught about Filipinos, you don't rock the boat, okay? just go with, go with the flow. So they were against it. And um, um, I, I tell a story about the Filipino community hall. You, you talk about how it's the, uh, it was the uh, centerpiece, the hub of activity centered around the strike. Uh, the votes uh, uh, meetings were there after the, after the walkout. That became headquarters. The Muslims would hang out over there after they were kicked out of the uh, of the labor camps by the growers uh, for going on the strike. So they hung out uh, at the Philippine Community Hall. Well, the Philippine Community Hall uh, was managed is, is a is an organization. Uh, it's a tax-based organization, and they have a president and a, and a and a group of officers. Well, the the elite class uh, were was usually in charge. You know, the the teachers, the the nurses, the doctors, they were kind of in charge. Well, Bob Armington, who ran a crew uh, for one of the farmers, took it upon himself to get himself elected, bring his brother along on the board. And when the strike had, when, when Larry came into town that summer, uh, after successfully uh, gaining a, a pay increase in Coachella, he had a plan to, to, uh, to take over the Philippine Community Hall. And so when he came down to a vote, uh, I mean, this is, this is I'm just guessing, uh, this is what apparently happened. I didn't witness it firsthand, but uh, when the vote came to allow Larry 
the use of the hall, the, the teachers and the uh, nurses said no, but there was enough that said yes. And those teachers and those nurses, they, they still ho hold that grudge. To really? This day. Against, because, against Armington and allowing Larry to speak? And, and, that, and that whole movement. Because, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I heard, yeah, yeah, I heard that firsthand uh, from some of them, some of them, my aunties, because because they were my aunties, right? They were they would talk kiss me here and there about, oh, you know, we uh, we don't have a community hall anymore. It's run by those by those those, those farm workers and, and and Larry and those guys, those people, uh, and so they. They took it uh, wrong. They, 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 didn't, they didn't see the whole picture. They saw it as something that was theirs, was something that was uh, uh, in their control. All of a sudden, it wasn't. Yeah. And so I remember that. You know, go ahead. Yeah, but basically, we have this schism between the farm workers, Larry, Ar the Armingtons, you know, trying to use the hall to, to have that vote, that all important mm -hmm. vote. And then we had uh, the nurses and the more middle class professionals. Uh, who resent to this day the use of the hall to take that vote? If right. they didn't, if they didn't have the hall, could they have had that vote? Could they have found another place? I don't or, know. If there's a place. I don't know. If there's a place big enough, you know, um, because it, it holds about 250 people, and it, like I said, it, uh, to me, uh, it was only fitting because uh, the community hall was the centerpiece of our community. Obviously, you know. That's that's where we went to our Christmas pageants. We uh, we went to our christenings. We went to uh, everything. That was yeah. that's another story about about the social aspect of the community hall. But it's true that every single Filipino community has at least one place yep. like that. And I, where I grew up in San Francisco, it was a Filipino community on California Street and Baker, <laughs> an old Victorian building. My sister was married there. This Absolutely. Is, this is where the parties were, even in an urban setting. So, and I've been to the Delano Filipino Community Hall, and when I first saw it, it looks like a, a kind of a gym, uh, a uh -huh. big a big yeah. center. I remember. Both floors. The, I remember the green color. I think it was green, <laughs> right? It's green. Oh yeah, it's like lime green something. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I I went there five years ago, when the fiftieth anniversary, celebrating the calling of the strike and you, you help sort of organize that. I mean, it was a great 50th anniversary celebration. I remember going down to, to Stockton uh, with my pal, Dylan Delvo, Dylan and I were, uh, I, I think I had a mask. I mean, I'm wearing a two here <laughs> now because I, my hair is too long, but I think I, I was making a joke about wearing a mask um, that we put it on Instagram or something, but we were driving down. It was a long drive from Stockton, but when we got there, man, what a celebration you put on, Alex, for the 50th. Thank you. And that okay, means you, know what? you had to bring those people together, the people who didn't like Larry. Well, let me, let me tell you the, 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 the backstory about that. Okay. So um, in that, uh, in February uh, of 2015, okay, I, uh, I take it upon myself, I go online. And I and I to, to the Fonz national website and I inquire about starting a chapter because I'd been convinced uh, too many things have, uh, uh, were going on. I, I come to realize that the new generation of Filipinos had no clue of what happened in '65. So I took it upon myself. Oh, you know, National American Historical Society makes sense. So I applied, and Auntie Dorothy gave me a call. And she said, you know what? We've been waiting for you for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she, she was, she said, we're waiting for you for years. Maybe not 50 years, but she said, we've been waiting you for years for some to step up, Alex. And Delano has been in our hearts uh, for uh, this many years. Okay. So I get this thing, I get the paperwork turned in. And then uh, two months later in April, I get a call from Roger Gadiano who you've interviewed in the past, and it's a jewel. He's another treasure. Uh, um, he's like six years older than me. Um, he calls me up and says, Alex, uh, I got a call from, uh, from these two women. The two women were Don Mabalon and Dr. Robin Rodriguez. Oh, yeah. And they said, Roger, uh, 
you know what this is, right? It's the 50th anniversary of the Great Strike. Yeah. And you know that UFW is hosting one at, or they're, uh, they're hosting their own event, right? Roger goes, yeah, I got the invitation. He goes, I th don't you think we should have our own? I think we should have our own. And so he calls me up and says, Alex, you're telling me that we should have our own. What do we do? I said, dude, I just started, I just started the paperwork for us, uh, for this organization. And it just makes sense. 50th anniversary, historical society. I said, we'll do it. And so we were chartered in June. We had the charter vote in June. And uh, two and a half months later, we were able to pull off this fantastic three-day event celebrating. And, and you know, a lot of it was, was Dawn and Robin because they had, they had the resources, they, they knew people. As soon as we said, let's do a panel talk, great. We'll have this person, this person, this person. I'm going, who are they? They're not from Delano, no. But they're woke people, they know what's going on. <laughs> and so without them, we couldn't pull it off. But then also without me and my, my group of Fonz uh, Delano people, we were all, we're all classmates. We're all about the same age. We're that bridge generation from, the, from our parents immigrating here to, to the new generation of Philippine Americans. And so I said, you know, we're doing that bridge. We need to make the connection. And so we put our, we, we worked our, our butts off for two and a half months to, to come up with a, a nationally and internationally uh, covered event. And so yeah. I'm just so, so very proud of it. Uh, you know, uh, it was such a big event that Emil Guillermo came to our event. Emil That's Guillermo. <laughs> That's how big an event it was. No, it means it means I finally stopped and I finally knew where to stop in Delano. I mean, I drew <laughs> so many times up and down 99. I said, where do I stop? Who do I, I call Alex? But I no, I, it was a tremendous event. And yeah, it was, I was very proud of it. It was it was great to see Paul Chavez, his yes. son, acknowledge that Filipinos had been left out of the narrative. Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, it's only, re it's only recently. The first time. Uh, no, the first time he'd done it. No, in the, in the uh, uh, you go to Ogbe in the village now. Uh, I think in 20, 2016 or twenty fourteen, I can't remember. They finally put up a plaque commemorating the the role of the Filipino Manongs because that, that village was created for the Manongs, right? Mm -hmm. and so Ogbeani means hero, right? Hero, yes. and uh, it's the senior. Essentially, it's the housing for seniors that was built by the UFW at the yep. encouragement of It Leong. And, yeah. and there and it Philip. is. And Philip. And Philip. And Philip. And let's not forget that uh, 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 Pete, Bo Pete Velasco, right? He was, mm -hmm. he was part of the, And his wife was living there. Uh, yeah. She just passed away, by the way. Right. She, uh, we, we, uh, Auntie we, Dolores. We, we remember that, uh, Auntie Dolores or Tita Dolores. So it's. Uh, it's funny how uh, that was such a great event. And to see Paul Chavez acknowledge that, mm -hmm. I think for, for someone like me, who has always said, hey, Larry Itliong was first, Larry Itliong was first, but to see Paul Chavez, the son of Cesar Chavez, personally acknowledge that, mm -hmm. I think yeah. that, that's, that's what struck me about the memory. Uh, and then second, yeah. Memories from guys like like you who lived through it, and because we don't get the full story about how it wasn't as simple and as easy as Larry no. said, "Strike, we went strike," you know, and then it was five long years, and not uh, not everyone lasted the five years. No, no, and uh, the the thing about it is the uh, the strike, uh, the movement was was still there. We uh, you could see it in. in in, in town, uh, the local Safeway, there, when the boycott started, uh, they, they would boycott the Safeway stores. And so, so there were still uh, visible signs. Uh, you drive by the Filipino Community Hall, uh, there would still be some monoms hanging out there because this the Aguilera village hadn't been built yet. And so uh, throughout, throughout growing up and then going to school, I mean, um, I went to, I started the high school in 68 and all of a sudden, I'm in the same classroom with, with the grower's sons. Yeah. You know, we would play basketball together. We would, uh, we would compete uh, in, 
in class against each other. And you know what? Um, they respected us. They, re they respected uh, uh, what we were doing. But, you know, their, their, their family, obviously, uh, they were on the wrong side. They, they were on the Grover side. Uh, you know, and, and I, I don't want to paint the Grovers as, as being uh, villains uh, too much. There were some, there were some very, very uh, uh, violent uh, growers. They were called the sheriff's department and start in order, order them to beat up their, their pickers. But you know what? Before the strike, the Filipino farm workers and the growers had such a, had such, had such, such a good relationship. I mean, you mentioned sabongs. Sabongs, the cockfights. On Sundays, uh, you know, my mom and dad would take the, the, the cockfights because because my uh, my uh, another close family that we had, they, they had the halo halo concession. Oh my God, I would sit there and, and help help my uncle uh, shave the ice, and yeah. so right, and uh, but we would see growers, farmers at the at the cockfights. Yeah. They would be there along along with them. They they would eat. Um, um, they were called chocolate meat, obviously, which is you know go on. Yeah, they they loved it, you know. They, uh, they um, our, our, our grower would even ask, you know, if mom, my mom could make some lumpia for for her, for, for his family. And so there was a uh, you got to remember the growers were first or second generation immigrants themselves. They they came from Italy from the from the uh, the 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 Baltic. The, Baltic. Baltic not Baltic. The, the the Balkan states. There, oh, were, there were Serb, oh. Serbs, Serbs, Croats, and right. uh, what have you. At that time, it was just the Yugoslavs. So there right. were there were Yugoslavians, and so they they knew about immigration, immigrants, and stuff. They would come to our stuff. Uh, in fact, the growers donated the property where the Filipino Community Hall now sits. Oh, right there in Delano. Yeah, they donated the property. They said, "Okay, you know, we'll do that for you." And so th there was a good relationship. Maybe it was more, uh, uh, you know, grower and, and worker thing. But right. but they, for the most part, I had good feelings about the growers. And, stuff. and I told you the story about my mom and uh, and grower, getting yeah. a wage increase for 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 the women. So yeah. um, it, it's a, it's such a it's such a complex issue that uh, that thirty minutes or an hour couldn't even give it justice. Right. You know, as to as to what was going on. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're beginning to just, you know, take, you know, chip away at this story. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that gets me is that when you talk about the schism that existed between the professionals, the nurses, you mentioned the nurses by name and Delano to this day, I mean, the UFW still exists, but the the nurses have been at the forefront of some yeah. major civil rights kind of actions. Yeah. Uh, at the hospital there in Delano, in terms of their yep. ability to to use Tagalog, in yes. you know at work uh, and other issues, uh, at that point, do the nurses cross over and see the spirit of Larry Itliong, uh, yes. you know, sort of invading their consciousness? Yeah, we we, uh, we had we had an event one time, and uh, this young young woman approached me, and she was one of those nurses who was who was embroiled in that. Uh, issue in the local hospital about them, them in the break room uh, uh, amongst themselves speaking their language. Right. And they said, is there anything you guys can do? I said, well, we have the resources to get connected to some people who can. And I, 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 gave, them, I gave her several numbers. And I hope they, and I think they were successful in, in getting, in getting their, their issue resolved. But yeah, the nurses finally saw, they, they came to our event honoring the, the, the Grape Strike movement. And so, the, yeah, you're right. They did uh, see the connection. So. Yeah, because sometimes it takes a while, you know. But in the end, mm -hmm. if you're Filipino, uh, you should. There's a there's a there's usually some point where you can, yeah, come together. You see in each other our common stories and our things sure. that that make us Filipino. You know, yeah. uh, we've been talking about Larry and the grape strike. You know, when you were talking about Safeway, because the grape strike was five years and then yeah. it it began, uh, then it became a boycott mm -hmm. against lettuce as well as grapes and gallo wine. And that to me, and then they struck 
against Safeway. If you grew up in mm -hmm. California, that was a big deal to see Safeway yeah. being struck. And there's some lasting things that occur when you're growing up, say, you know, your teen years or even younger, and you see those images that almost make that sometimes you are reminded of that. And when given a choice of where to go shopping, you might go somewhere else, right? Or, <laughs> right. There, or you remember things, oh, I'm supposed to boycott grapes. Do, do I still boycott grapes? And I remember going <laughs> on the East Coast, living on the East Coast for a while. Yeah. There, there was boycott of grapes and Gallup products. And so these things are historical, but they have lasting impacts on individuals, on groups. Here we are talking about it 55 years later. Um, yeah. What is the lasting impact on you, Alex Edelor, uh, in terms of the, of the grape strike on, on your life, you think? You know, I think, I think the grape strike to me uh, kind of launched uh, Filipinos to uh, reach a little farther uh, for things. It's, uh, you know, that seven years after the grape strike, the town of Delano elects the first Filipino mayor in Leonard Velasco. Okay, so um, I think it brought, it brought us up out of the woodwork. We were kind of, uh, farm workers in general, were, were, were kind of like, uh, like wallpaper. You don't see it until, until you look at it, right? Um, we were kind of non-existent. Uh, we would show up uh, in, in, in Delano like, like we, uh, if we had to go to the bank or my mom had to go pay bills, uh, we come straight from the fields to the office. We, we come stamping in about three o'clock, three thirty in the afternoon, and and we would go do our business. And so, so the, the regular business of Delano wouldn't see us until we, we were kind of like invisible to them. And I think, uh, to me, personal uh, uh, story is that I came out of my shell. I ah. came out of my, I came out of my, you know, I don't want to be seen. I want to be as acculturated as possible. I came out and said, you know what? Screw those guys. I want to be me. I'm proud to be Filipino. I'm going to do what I'm going to do because I'm Filipino. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. And, um, and there was, a, there was always a thing. We talk about the colonial mentality thing. You know, there's always the, the need to please and to, to, you know, to give in. And I think the great strike, what Larry taught me was no, you don't settle for that. You don't ever settle for that. You don't, you don't ever fade into the background. You do what you can. And remember, you know, I, I tell you the story. I got to know Larry after the, after his union stuff. He went out and started the Senior Citizen Service Center. Right there, his office was I uh, was in the front room of the Philippine Community Hall. He got my Roger me involved in political activism. He, uh, he talked about, uh, uh, was it FAVA, Philippine American Voters Association or, or right. Political Association, FAPA. And then he talked, he, he got us involved. Uh, we were his legs and, and hands um, with, the, with the Filipino Voters League. Local elections, we would walk the streets, uh, put, put hangers on doors, uh, stuffed mailboxes for him. And we saw the value of that. Uh, and after Larry passed away, we continued that fight. We were, we were kind of an ad hoc organization. There was no meeting. There was no organization. It was like a phone call. Hey, Alex, um, I, um, what do you think about the local election? I think we should go with this person or that person. Yeah, I think so too. You know? And all of a sudden, the local politicals came to recognize it and they come calling to us because yeah. we had we had the uh, mailing lists that Larry left behind. And, and so, that's, that's Larry's legacy. Larry's spirit is is, yes. uh, is tied up into that kind of activism. Yeah. It, and it, it boils into creating a political voice, really. Yeah. Right? It, so it's not just about yourself. It's about others. And I think, uh, I think the, I don't know if you, uh, maybe it's a bad impression, but uh, I see kind of like uh, uh, the, the Filipinos, some Filipinos I encounter, the newcomers, they're in it, they're in it for themselves. You know, they, they oh, I, I want to buy, a, I want to work hard and buy a house. I want to work hard and, and, and start a business. Okay, that's fine and good. 
but there should be another another side that's that's more about the common good, you know, not just yourself, but everybody else. And that's what Larry, to me, uh, uh, kind of drove home to me, was that it's not just about you. You know, it's about your people, and I grew to to understand that. Um, the thing about uh, my upbringing was my mom and dad. The dinner table was was conversations. I don't know, but it was about your dad. But they always talked glowingly about back home stories. Of, oh, back home, the ampalaya was this big. You know, the talong was this long. You know, and oh, oh the seniguelas. Oh, you know, they talked so glowing about the Philippines. Wow. But when I finally went back to the Philippines at age 18, you know, uh, I was disappointed. So long, not so was, <laughs> it wasn't so big that Ampalaya was like meager. I said, we throw those out too much. <laughs> Just like when you first came to uh, America and saw San Francisco all lit up. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, my go God. Back. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's it's funny because are, you're talking about Larry being the instigator of this. Larry being the guy who says, "Hey, think about the community bigger than, larger than yourself." Larger than myself. Was there anyone else talking about this? Was there anyone else saying this aside from Larry? Was there anyone else with the vision, the same vision of Larry Itlow? You know what I. I uh... That's a good question. Uh, I didn't stop to think about it, but yeah, there were members in the community and Bob Arvington was one uh, um, that, that, that was a role model for me. You understand, this guy had it made in the shade. He was, uh, he operated a camp for, for a small grower, right? He managed, he lived in the camp, he fed the, uh, he fed the boys. Uh, he, he, had, he had the most to lose. Yet he went on a strike, and to me, uh, Uncle Bob was such a such a such a soft-spoken guy, but very very deeply committed to, to these ideals, and he was a role model to me. Um, there was a there was a man on Felix Arroy, Marissa Arroy's uh, relative. Uh, he he lived, he he died at 103, but he was one of the first businessmen in Delano. He 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 was a barber. Who start who, who 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 opened up a business in Chinatown in Delano, and he was a role model to me because he was um, when we were young college students and stuff. He was the guy that would encourage us. Yeah. He he made uh, he opened up his house so that we can come in and meet because because uh, 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 you know out of this activism we in '75 we started Philippine Weekend, which is uh, uh, the Big Delano thing, they, they would have celebrated, yeah, they would have celebrated their their forty fifth anniversary this year, but they had to cancel it because of COVID nineteen. We started it out of scratch, yeah. uh, a bunch of college kids, um, a couple of people with vision, um, um, Manu Felix, who was older established guy, but he had a calling. He he wanted to see young people uh, active, and he was very encouraging to us and stuff. And I. God, I praise his soul uh, to this very day. He was, uh, he was just a very wonderful guy. Uncle Bob and my Uncle Phil, uh, Martin Felix, for sure. And yeah. so I think every community has that, you know, uh, that uh, people who inspire them and stuff. So uh, to them, I, you know, I do this out of out of honor and respect to them. I want to, uh, like I tell the young people, you got to carry the torch, man. You got you got to bring light to to people. Um, we had a. Uh, a Zoom meeting uh, a couple of years, a couple of months ago, I think it was the Fonz meeting and stuff. And, and I, I brought up the point that that uh, part of my mission, part of my reason for starting Fonz was to bridge that generation. And I think we need to tell these stories. Yeah. More, more. Uh, Gail Romasanta started the ball rolling with her with her book. Kids need to read this. Need uh, need to have this indelible in their upbringing, just like we knew about. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, you know, we knew about them. We got to know about uh, Philip Veracruz and Larry Itlong and what it means to me as a Filipino American. Well, you know, Alex, that's why I, I thought we should talk this Labor Day starting today yeah. on the 5th, you know, because we know that the strike vote happened on the 7th. They walked out on the 8th. We know that chronology. We know how people were 
uh, you know, how, how people were on the street. We know how it was the Filipinos first. We know that the Mexicans were not there. Cesar Chavez was not there. And yet Cesar Chavez gets the credit. You know, we haven't really explored this, but was there ever any resentment? Did you feel any resentment about that, that Larry at Leong, and this is even when you got to know him later on after the strike, because there was still some, you know, some little back talk about between Chavez and the union and at Leong at when he left in 71. Was what, what, you know, was there a resentment in the community that at Leong was forgotten? Oh, absolutely. Oh, God. Are you kidding me? Uh, going to college, you know, they were, they were, uh, it was all about Cesar Chavez and the movement. And I kept telling them, no, dude. Yeah. Uh, Larry Italy started that thing. And they go, they just kind of dismissed me. Okay, yeah. whatever. Um, you know, there was an animosity towards the UFW. And I witnessed that firsthand. I mean, uh, I came home from college one, uh, one summer to work with my dad and, and they had already signed the contracts this early seventies. And my dad goes, well, we got to go to union hall, to the hiring hall, you know, because uh, um, before then, if you want to start work, you just, you just drove into the fields and said, Hey, well, I want to work. Go ahead. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. So we went to the hiring hall and there I got the witness. Uh, I don't know whether it was a, uh, it was, it was a, an ethnic thing or maybe because they were, they were finally in power, but the union was terrible to my dad. Oh, yeah. They, uh, he'd been working at this, at, this, uh, at this farm for 15 years prior to that. And, and because, he, uh, because he didn't live there, or didn't live in Delano permanently because he was still, he was still in the migrant circuit, right? Mm -hmm. he, he used to go off to Alaska for, for six weeks. He'd still go off to, to Coachella Valley. He said, well, no, uh, uh, we would give uh, seniority to more permanent members. Oh my God, I was devastated for my dad. I was so, so, so upset. I was devastated. I said, this is, this, we fought for this and this is what we get. Well, this is the thing, the whole hiring hall idea, it, yeah. it changed things. And when they started prioritizing the labor, the Filipinos mm -hmm. were left out. Another, another little out. known irony that you bring out yeah. uh, to add to the insults of, you know, leaving out Larry Itliong from the narrative that, you mm -hmm. know, only we can, you know, they come out when we talk about them. We, we, they come out right. in, in these conversations. And, um, you know, I, I just heard about that recently and now you confirmed it. It, it happened. Mm -hmm. how'd, your yeah. how'd, how'd your dad feel? Oh, he was, he was, he was, uh, he was devastated. He was de uh, devastated. He eventually, I think he changed farms. That's what, that's what it was. We moved to a different farm. We were able to, to get work, but, but, but he left this, this crew of guys that he worked with for 15 years, this camp that he would go to on Sundays to play cards with. Uh, you know, that was part of his social life was go back to the mountains there and play cards. I knew I knew all the mountains by, by first name. You know, the, there was Uncle Philip. You know, my uh, uh, mom and uh, uh, Kalino. I mean, they were like my uncles to me, and we had to leave them. Yeah. So yeah, it it was it was it was uh, it was upsetting. Uh, but yeah, there were some good things too. We we, uh, um, we got the benefit of the of the of the of the clinic. Uh, the, the clinic was was certainly a godsend. Uh, the the staff that the staff that worked at were like were like saints and angels. They were just so accommodating to, to everything. Uh, there's a story about uh, a friend of mine who's, who contracted Valley Fever uh, working on the fields, but because the, the clinic was willing to pursue uh, experimental uh, remedies, they saved his life. Uh, the doctors in town wouldn't, wouldn't touch him. Okay, so, Al Alex, uh I know we've we've gone over and we're sort of winding down, but I want to acknowledge some some people in the chat on our Facebook live page sure. at Bonds Museum on Facebook. Here, here's a question. Someone, this is Art uh, Silva, Arambulo Silva says, I always wonder why none of the published books about Larry Leong's story does not include 
UFWOC, United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, and instead exalts UFW all the time. Wasn't the OC of UWFOC a nod um, to Ed Leong's AWOC as a protagonist of the farm worker movement's narrative? Also, uh, tell me, I mean, did, I, I noticed that it's mostly AWOC that gets included and UFWOC does not get included. Why do you suppose that is the case? Well, my understanding was, was UFWOC was, uh, was the initial merger was the initial um, name they gave because because Chavez had the NFWA right. and uh, uh, Larry had the AWOC. So uh, my understanding was that they, they kind of merged the names and went with the UFWOC. You're right. I think the OC was an acknowledgement to, to uh, Larry's uh, organization. And then uh, when they moved out to 40 acres, then they, would, they decided just just lop off the OC and just United Farm Workers uh, uh, thing. I don't know the the background behind that. I was not in town anymore. Yeah. Uh, that was going on. Well, all right. I guess this is kind of a conspiracy theory, but is it a tactic <laughs> used by Mexican nationalism? This is again from a, the question to erase mm -hmm. the Filipino aspect of the narrative to be an equal protagonist, if not greater than the Mexicans in the entire West Coast U.S. civil rights and labor movement. Oh, I totally that, believe that. You do believe I totally that. believe that. There, there was a, uh, after our, our 50th anniversary event, uh, there was another uh, uh, event hosted by Cal State Bakersfield, okay, in which uh, there was, there were some, some uh, uh, there were two uh, professors, uh, historians, who'd written books that were uh, negative towards the UFW. And uh, there was an infamous email uh, sent out to some Hispanic professors uh, urging them to boycott or, or ban these two authors from this event. So yeah, th th there's a movement to try to, 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 try to denigrate the, uh, the role of the, uh, the Filipinos and to upgrade the, uh, the role of the Hispanics. Yeah, I believe that. Well, well, this is the thing about having a grassroots community organization like FONS and having the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum around to to help get these stories out there, because uh, look, there's there's several worlds going on in parallel, right? There's the academic historic historical world and I don't know if they're having a hard time understanding that Mexicans and Filipinos and any, you know, any people of color exist, right? Mm -hmm. That's the traditional academic world. It's changing over the last 50 years. We started to see a change in, in uh, what they call the, uh, uh, you know, the hollowed halls of academia. Mm -hmm. We've seen a change in the canon where they even acknowledge, they begin to acknowledge the existence of people of color but it's still relatively young in the, the long history, right? Of, ac of the academic world. So where, where we sit as Filipino Americans and people of color who have these historical societies and can talk and tell these stories, if we talk and tell these stories and we record them and we make it public, we're on record. We're on record and 20 years from now, you know, just like 50 years, you know, ago, right? Things happened and actually more than 50 years ago in the 1930s. So that's uh, almost a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. right? You have things that were documented and recorded in Filipino American newspapers, right? And where do the historians of today go to see what the heck happened back then? They go to the first draft, the newspapers, the Balitang, and there it is, right? There were lynchings in Lodi. There were riots mm -hmm. in Stockton. There, everyone covered Watsonville, but were there others? You know, maybe not covered in the mainstream, but there, there's documented history, first draft, and just like those papers help, you know, provide the research for Don Mabalan and her book, Little Manila's in the Heart, Hopefully someday the things that we do here at the Fonz Museum 
will be used by researchers and scholars 20 years hence. The, the people who we're bridging to, right, who yeah. take up the scholarship and say, what were the stories that Mono Alex was, uh, was saying? <laughs> yeah. What was the story with that, that guy who sounds white, uh, you know, at the museum? What was, what was he saying? <laughs> You know, what were, what were they talking about and what, why is it real? And maybe we will be just like I went to the Wikipedia page of uh, the grape strike. And um, one of the stories that I wrote, um, albeit it was for NBC News, it was mentioned in the citation. So it's good. So if people go to that, I don't know the exact citation or but it was referenced. But this is how historians put together the they're not alternate facts. That's Trump's term, alternate facts. Right. But this is how people put together and not rewrite history, but write history, right? right. Um, it's a matter of rewriting when, you know, to correct, you know, what's out there. And just by talking about Larry Itliong and insisting that we talk about Itliong when we talk about the grape strike, we're appending. We're not just rewriting, we're appending history. And this is an important part of that. So, Alex, so thank you for helping me try to create some history here by making sure people understand what we're talking about and and um, make sure that, I mean, to, to this day, when you hear people not mention or not know Larry Itliong, does it bother you? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I see light at the end of the tunnel, though. Yeah. I, I, I've witnessed people say, hey, um, oh, you know what? The uh, local school, the uh, one of the biggest school districts in the nation, Vegas Hill City School District, they contacted me uh, several weeks ago and I gave them a bunch of information, but uh, they are going to put out their October newsletter. This is a resource newsletter for teachers, uh, K through eight, um, that uh, they're going to include uh, Filipino uh, stories. They they want to observe Filipino uh, historical month, South American History Month. So I I gave them a bunch of information. I contacted Marissa Roy for for her uh, permission to to uh, to show them Delano Manongs and stuff. And then I, I want to raise uh, uh, Marissa because she grew up here. Right. This is where she was raised. And so yeah, you know I I see little chinks there. Our, our high school district contacted me as well a couple of years ago because they want to incorporate in their curriculum a little bit about the Filipinos up in Delano, uh, the strike and about the uh, the, uh, the the um, the soldiers, the, the first infantry, yeah. the Filipino, yeah. Right. So it, it's, it's, our day is coming. Our day is coming. We just, but we need to have you and me continue this, this dialogue and, and, and uh, broadcast it. Let yeah. other people know that this is that there are people like us who know who have this information that they did not know. We have people like us that are inspiring people to go out, tell that story, you know, share that story with other people. So let them know that Filipinos is not just about Manny Pacquiao, you know, we're, we're a deeper uh, society than that. We yeah. uh, we were there at the farm workers movement. We're there at the civil rights movement. So you know what? I thank you for for this uh, for this platform. Well, Alex, uh, it's important that uh, you know we we have the Fonz, we have the Fonz Museum, we have our stories, and I like to tell people that even though in COVID the Filipino uh, American National Historical Society Museum has been shut down, we we have been shut down since March. We have these check-ins. We check in Saturday and Sunday at noon. You know, just that's when we're open. Come check us, check us out. You can have, uh, we'll tell stories. And, you know, because my, my, uh, my goal as the museum director is to let people know that the museum is where you are. You know, whether you're in Delano or New York City or Chicago or LA, San Francisco, the museum is where you are. And if you go on Facebook, you get these conversations. We've recorded them. And if you've enjoyed the conversations, if you are there at home, we're enjoying it live. We do it live because some people like like the live aspect. They go, oh, it's live. It, it could die on us like you know, at any time. 
And then afterwards it's recorded. But the whole idea is if you've enjoyed my discussion with Alex, my conversation, hey, uh, consider a donation to the Fonz Museum. You can also maybe think of Fonz, the national organization, but the Fonz Museum in particular, we're autonomous, we bring this to you. And we're working on making our entire museum collection virtual. Consider a uh, tax deductible donation to our 501c3. Uh, put something in the box, email me at filipinomuseum at gmail.com. And uh, I, I thank you uh, for being here. Alex, thank you. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue our discussion because we're not done with Delano. We're not, <laughs> and we're not, we're not done talking with it about Larry. So we'll talk about Larry during his birthday's coming up in, in October, Filipino American National Histor uh, Filipino American uh, History Month is October. My birthday, your birthday too, right? October, right? October 30th. There it is. Okay. So we're all there in October. <laughs> I'm toward the beginning of the month. You're toward the end. Larry's in the middle. It's a celebration <laughs> all month long. Yeah. We'll tell stories and, as long if even if we're in lockdown in COVID, we can still connect this way. So, uh, Alex, uh, thank you again uh, for being here. We're we're gonna we're gonna continue talking. Uh, today we talked about Larry, the grape strike, the importance of the grape strike, and the real story behind Delano Filipinos. Uh, on Sunday, per, our program Sunday, we're, we're going to talk about New York City and All the right. Filipinos in New York City and New Jersey. Every week. It's something different. Tell your friends about uh, this program. Um, it's uh, this week in American Filipino history, or Filipino American history, and we talk about stuff. So, so thank you again. If you've missed any of the recording, it'll be up here on our Facebook page live. Uh, sometimes I post things on my personal page at amok.com, and I write about Alex and Larry at Leong on my Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund site, aldef.org slash blog. So uh, thank you, Alex, for that. Thank you, everyone. It's Labor Day. Think about Larry at Leong, right, Alex? I mean, yep. who, who is the Asian American <laughs> labor, labor leader? Can you name <laughs> one? I mean, I mean, and most people will just forget but they shouldn't forget, Larry. I mean, if if they, I mean, really, can you name one Asian American labor leader? Can, can you think of one in history? Well, I know uh, Chris Gonzalez. Okay, all right. So you know some, <laughs> but I mean, but like, who's a household name? Like, like Ch no, like no, and, uh, and Chris should be a household name. Well, so, all right. Tell me about Chris. What did Chris do? Well, uh, uh, he was he was he was up in Stockton, I uh, I think, because uh, uh, I had a conversation with Dawn about uh, about Chris Monsalves because she was oh. trying to she was trying to connect uh, uh, Larry's activism and where the roots came from, and and she mentioned him and stuff and said that. So that's See, all I know I, about him. I've seen Chris Monsalves' name, but I don't I don't know him. I mean, I don't know enough about him, but you see, this is what happens. Larry is, he's kind of the figurehead, but when he gets cut off by, by the mainstream narrative, you don't hear from about anybody. You don't hear about, I mean, yeah. Philip Veracruz is up there and he gets some, some love from historians, but not nearly as much as he should, considering Larry Lees and Philip is right up there with, with Chavez. You know, Velasco, P. Velasco, a little bit, but you know, it begins with Larry. That's Once why. Larry... Yeah, that's yeah. why we need to keep telling the story, keep telling the story, and and uh, and uh, we can do this every year around Labor Day. <laughs> we, we can, can have it. a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> every, every year. Well, I was wondering. I said, you know, God, I wonder if Alex is going to do a fifty-fifth celebration. <laughs> Maybe, uh, maybe a 60th. Maybe. I maybe don't know. Uh, no, our, our COVID shut us down, so we're not going to be able to do uh, yeah. anything. But uh, yeah, maybe a 60th. Maybe, maybe a 60th. We'll see you there, right? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I will <laughs> be there. I will be there. And, and it's that's... only if it's only if it's big enough for you. Okay. Oh no no no! It's, <laughs> it's gonna be. Big. It's I, no. We're gonna be there. We're gonna, if you're having a stick to it, I'm gonna be there. I'll have up there with the the vegan sisig truck. Oh uh, no, uh, not vegan. <laughs> Vegan Filipino, it's a thing. It's a thing. Alex, thank okay. you very much. And at this point, stay on the line there, Alex. I'm going to say okay. thank you to our Facebook crowd. We have 11 people. Well, I can't, I shouldn't say that. It looks like more like 100 or 1,000, or it could be like 100 <laughs> or 100,000. It doesn't matter. Look, we're recorded. Uh, come, come catch us the full recording later. I thank you if you've checked in with the museum on our Facebook page. And if you're checking us out on other venues, I thank you for that. I've been joined by Alex Edelor, uh, Delano, born and bred, talking about Larry Itleong, talking about the grape strike. I'm Emil Guillermo. I'm the museum director of the Fonz Historical Society, the Filipino American Historical Society Museum. Thank you again. And we will now end our uh, our live broadcast if i can go to our live page and if i can figure out how to end it great i'm trying to end it gracefully alex i'm trying to like every time i want to bow i'm like i'm stuck okay here oh this is what you do all right thank you very much again back again sunday at noon pacific three eastern we're going to talk about new york city philip the big apple filipinos they ain't got nothing on the Delano Filipinos. Yeah. Nothing. But but they, they've got a big thriving community. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. Join us again. Don't forget, check out our Fonz Museum page on Facebook. Have yourselves a great Labor Day weekend and get in touch with us. Tell your story. The museum is where you are.